in Isaiah um, 29, where it talks about the learned men and the learned men unlearned. That's what it says. It's, the question is, is there a typo on page 6, fifth paragraph, last sentence? And he's going to quote from it. It says, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, read this, I pray thee, and he say, I am not learned. That's the way it reads. And it's identified that there's two classes in Adventism. It's those that are learned, and they can't, they don't understand the book that is sealed, because they say that it, that it is sealed. And then there's another class in Adventism that don't understand the book that is sealed because they will, they take the position that they will only accept the truth from teachers that are learned, that have been learned. So they're saying, I'm only going to accept the message if it comes from the general conference. You know, when I first became an Adventist, I heard people say that to... Not, they didn't really mean it. They weren't being facetious and they weren't being negative. They were just saying, you know, Lord help us if we ever get to the point in time where we think that the final morning message is going to be something that comes out in the review and herald through the the, the general conference. And uh, it was just an illustration. But I heard that a few times when I first became an Adventist, which was around 1976. But now I've actually, I know people that have actually taken that position about this message and told, told their congregation or told their friends, this can't be the truth unless it comes to the general conference. So there, in Isaiah 29, there's two levels of Adventism, the, the leadership and the laity, the leadership that can't understand uh, prophecy because they say it's a sealed book, and the laity won't understand prophecy because they'll only accept the prophetic message if it comes from the leadership. It's like a catch-21, um, if you know that whole world of book and movies. <coughs> so is there any place I can find fully compiled information on both of the charts, 43 and 50? I want to fully understand them and be able to logically and with proof share this life. Where do I get the information on the two charts where I can study it and teach it in, in one source? Well, uh, a quick source would be uh, Prune's book has a good chapter on the chart. Uh, Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 4. Uh, the Dance Team book has uh, both charts in the back of the book. Uh, Foundations of Seventh day Adventist right. Message and Mission. Right, and then uh, that's about it. You don't have much out there on the main chart. Wait, Brother Greg was, yeah, the 43 and 5th chart, but, go ahead. The best, the best thing to understand the charts themselves is to take the texts that are on the charts and study the charts in cooperation with the texts that are on the charts, and that's how you learn the chart. We didn't tell the story here, but it's on plenty of our <coughs> presentations. I'll tell it. It really reduced down quickly. Now, James White was born legally blind. Most Adventists don't know that because the right history has been sealed up. And when he got to be about 17 or 18 years old, miraculously his eyes healed up and he went to school and he started in kindergarten. kindergarten. By the end of the year, he was graduating high school and tutoring the other students. He was hungry for education. And you can find this in the book. What's the book you had up here? Well, the first Life, Life Incidences. Life Incidences of, of, by James White, and uh, recently republished in the past few years. And so he was getting, that summer after school, he was getting ready to save money, saving money, going to work so he could go to the university. All he wanted to do was become a teacher. And his wife told him about, his mother told him about some Millerite meetings. He went down to the Millerite meetings, and then he became convinced all he wanted to do was teach this Millerite message. So he had come with the Lord, to give an opportunity to teach it. Uh, knock came on the door, invited him to go present the Millerite message, which he did, and he was a complete and utter failure. <laughs> Just terrible, terrible meeting. So what he did is he took the 1843 chart, he put it up on the wall in his bedroom, and he did not leave his bedroom until he had every verse and every symbol on that chart memorized and understood, and from that point on, he was one of the strongest Millerite preachers there were. 
So the reality of it is when Brother Greg was bringing up this question, someone, I think Jamal or maybe Dwayne, it wasn't me that answered up front. Um, the reality of it is to understand it, you, you have to do your own homework. And uh, there are some source materials, but you have, you're going to have to just dig into it. You can get those charts, you know, I can give you the phone number. Yeah, Kathy has phone numbers. Yeah, Kathy, my wife has those phone numbers too. Yeah. Um, or you can get both those charts and pay for them. Five dollars or One thing I have to say about the crew book, however, he gives you some uh, opinions of his based on. Yeah, I was going to say that. He, he gives you some opinions there that you need to. Uh, I'm glad you fessed up. He's not, he is not a, a good historian. He's a good historian when you get the facts without adding some opinion. Because one, when you start adding opinion to history, then it's no longer a history. So the information he gives you on the 1842 chart is volume 4 of the prophetic of our fathers is tainted by his opinion. That's the nicest way to say it. And, and, and once you say it for yourself, uh, you'll see uh, clearly that uh, he's wrong on one of his opinions in there. Based, based on this one piece of evidence that he gives, because Lynch writes a letter to Miller, and Miller never, we, we don't know if Miller responded. And so then, through, because we don't have a response letter to get what Miller would write a response, from that then he forms a conclusion, which is his own idea. Which is not based on fact. Concerning the data. Concerning the data. Right. Is that the same room that changed the doctors? Um, same rooms that participated in the book questions and doctors. Um, but it, I, 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 when you write them up, I thought, oh, I want to say something, but you corrected yourself. But it doesn't. You virtually can't find that book anymore. Yeah, well, let's not see you wrong and tell me now. But the, but the deal is, is the, the deal is, you know, third <laughs> question. <laughs> I intellectually understood the patterns and lines upon lines. How does this equate to the experience required for the last project? Um, well, based upon these patterns, and I'm not cutting it off, but I'm trying to get through all ten of these questions. The, the line upon lines, one of the lessons that they're teaching is that there's an increase of knowledge that begins at the time of the end. And those people that, what was the, what Jamal read, they, um, I mentioned it a couple times, the, the progressive revelation. Those people, he, he was his progressive revelation, but Jamal read a quote in his presentation the day that was something magic here. It was a uh, much better term. The something glory. Advancing glory. The advancing glory. Those people that, that are involved with keeping abreast of the advancing glory, of the increase of knowledge, what, what they're doing is, is they're keeping up with the messages that the Lord is bringing to light during these histories from His Word. And, the, and we as Adventists have always understood that we are sanctified through His Word. So we're allowing Christ, as the author of all prophecy, to select which passages of prophecy he wants us to consume, to be sweet in our mouth. And the promise is, is if we will keep in step with the advancing glory, advancing glory that those truths that we are consuming are the truths that will sanctify us <clears throat> through his word. So there, that's the process. We're, we've been illustrating these histories but we've been trying to emphasize that we need to to actually participate in these histories now that all the history that they were all pointing forward to is taking place. And in order to do that, that means keeping up with this advancing glory. And it's through that that the Lord humbles us in the dust. This is a kind of Brother Jeff, um, Alan Dewey is a messenger of God. Thank you. Will you tell us your comments? Theology, or some people think that it's not. It's only a messenger of God. Yeah, I, I, I'm hesitating to answer because I, I know some people that will say that and they'll mean one thing, and some people will say the very same yeah, thing and they'll mean another thing. I actually I don't know what they mean by that. 
Well, I know I know one brother that says that, and what he means is that when it comes to certain passages in the spirit of prophecy that he doesn't agree with, that he takes his opinion on it and says that Sister White is wrong in that area because she's not a theologian, and that's his very words. Okay, so it can be a very negative statement, but if you if you want to say she's not a theologian, and then you look at William Miller's final statement on his rules of biblical interpretation. He puts theologians in such a negative light, well, then you can say, well, hey, Thank I'm God. Glad she's not a theologian. <laughs> so you can go either way with that. Um, but you're right. We are safe with just saying that she is a messenger of the Lord. In some way. Directed by the Holy Spirit, who is infallible. How could someone be a messenger of the Lord that wasn't? Directed by the Holy Spirit. You mentioned Ellen G. White said paraphrase, not to talk much about 144,000 literal or symbolically expressly in crowds. Can you give me any proofs on that literal side? I know you believe this, and I can see that, but can't find proofs for literal. Not really important, just wanted to put my mind at rest. I'm going to pass over it because you said not really important. Um, and go on to the next one because I don't even know if we'll get through them all. If the new term for me, I may have it wrong, if the, if the 11th hour workers, I gather they are non adventists during the time of trouble, are not to be taught this message, what message are they to be taught? Let me read you a quote. Um, and I, I do agree that that is the, this message that we're dealing with is the wake up message for Seventh Day Adventists. That's how I understand it. And there is a different message for um, the notes. You probably have it in here somewhere. There's a quote where Sister Wright says, Does somebody have it on the white CD ROM turned on? Yeah. Okay, he's got one. Um, type in, only world warned. Quote. But sing it's signalization. She uses a kind of a really uh, archaic word. I, I, only world warned. Put signalization. Signalization. Signal. Like a, a, a warning single or a signal. S S I G N A L I C A T I. Well then we're spelling it wrong. Okay. Only put only way world. Anyway, he's getting that up. She said the only way that the world can be warned is by seeing people with the seal of God. There's three here. Okay. Look for the one for Bible trainings. Uh, Review and Herald of Home Missionary and Four Spirit Prophecy. Um, what? Well, what did they say? Give me some more words. Um, Give me those words. The, words. the only way the world can be warned. This is not the complete. Okay, let's let's move on. She had she has a quote, where, but it's you have to look at the paragraph closely. She says the only way the world can be warned is by seeing uh, those that are sanctified by the truth, living in a high and holy, elevated sense. And then, and then she goes into a couple sentences where she, it's during the Sunday law crisis. Signalization is the, is in there. It, it's, if you, it's a we're, we're spelling it wrong. Type in signalization. Not single. Signal. Okay, try that. No. That's it. You got it. Okay, read that to us. Uh, paragraph? Yeah. <clears throat> the word of the Holy Spirit is to convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The world can only be warned by seeing those who believe the truth, sanctified through the truth. Amen. 
acting upon high and holy principles, showing in a high and elevated sense the line of demarcation between those who keep the commandments of God and those who trample them under their feet. Meaning, they can only be warned during this Sunday law crisis. They, 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 it's when the the law of God is being trampled underfoot. So this is this is the message for the eleventh hour workers. The only way they can be warned is by seeing these people. Go ahead. The sanctification of the Spirit signalizes the difference between those who have the seal of God and those who keep a spurious rest day. When the test comes, it will be clearly shown what the mark of these is. It is the keeping of Sunday. Those who, after having heard the truth, continue to regard this day as holy. Bear the signature of the man of sin who thought to change kind of law. So if you read that a couple times, it, Bible, Bible. Uh, BT, which is Bible Training School. Bible Training, Bible training School, 1903, August 1st. If you if you shrink that paragraph down and you don't do it, you're not going to do any damage to it by summarizing it as this. The only way the world can be warned is by seeing people with the seal of God in the Sunday morning mm-hmm. crisis. Their warning message is to see Christ in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their warning message is not to return and understand how William Miller put together the 1843 chart and how we lost our foundational understandings. Uh, the final movements are rapid ones. The latter rain grows as fire and stubble. They need to see Christ in this testing uh, Do you suppose that we use Big Dash in, in chapter 9, verse 17 because it was desolate? Yes. Yes, that's, that's why. Um, how do I approach someone that does not believe they need to study prophecy? Prayerfully. Um, you, there's there's one quote in Testimonies, Volume Five, where she says, um, "We are all called to be students of prophecy," Amen. And, and, and that's her her words, but she really knows it now. Um, that one I probably have. And it's a good one. Okay, I have it, but I'm not turning the right to it. Someone want to look that up every. I'm sorry. Students of prophecy. Individually, no matter man's intellectual advancement, we're all called to be prophets. Is this from uh, Testimonies Volume Five? I have that. We'll t- type in Mark Testimonies Volume Five and put intellectual understanding prophets. Well, he looks for that. Could you lay a simple line with dates and a short explanation of the state of the churches of Revelation? I don't fully understand that last, the last two. This is a new light to me. Even the last two, I'm just now grasping. We, we did a little bit of that. And I would, I would counsel you to, um, Sister White, says that every Seventh-day Adventist should own the book Thoughts on Daniel Revelation by Uriah Smith. She doesn't say it directly like that, but she says that every Seventh-day Adventist should be handing that book out to their neighbors, and I don't know how we can hand it out to our neighbors if we don't own it. And in in the passage where she says that, she says it is God's helping hand. Now, there are some misconceptions in that book, but it is still the best book written for a pioneer understanding on Daniel Revelation that you're going to find out there. And in there, he'll give you a very good uh, standard understanding of the seven churches. Oh, you found it. Thank you. Um, This is Testimonies, Volume 5, page 708. Whatever may be man's intellectual advancement, let him not for a moment think that there is no need of thorough and continuous searching of the scriptures for greater light. As a people, we are called individually to be students of prophecy. 
we must watch with earnestness that we may discern any ray of light which God shall present to us. We are to catch the first gleamings of truth, and through a prayerful study, clear light may be obtained, which can be brought before others. Mm -hmm. 708, Testimony 25, thank you. Paragraph 2. Yeah. Um, unless I misunderstood, if the fourth angel's message is given in troublous times, does it not stand to reason? That this is when we shall finish in the time of trouble. I get it. it it's, although Sister White never uses the term little time of trouble, it is an Adventist term and it's accurate. And at the Sunday Law in the United States begins the little time of trouble. For national apostasy is followed by national ruin. It's the time of God's destructive judgment, Sister White says. So from from that time period is when Adventism is calling the gods of their children that are the, in Babylon out. There is a time of trouble. There's escalating disasters. There's war. Um, and that little time of trouble escalates and continues until human probation closes and Michael stands up and then begins the great time of trouble and time of Jacob's trouble. But uh, it's in that time period, the little time of trouble, when the loud cry of the fourth angel is going to 11th hour In the pattern of Christ and the Antichrist on the Anti, where is the second of the seventh week? Good question. I haven't, I haven't seen that. Yet. You don't you don't always see, and I mentioned this early on, you may not remember, you don't always see every characteristic in each line. All you need, but all you need is two or three and it's established. And the pattern of Christ, I can show you five of those lines. We didn't show five, and there may be more. It's well, all those square marks are established. Who was the strange being crying, whoa, whoa? The message of woe from the four winds. We don't know, we don't know who he was, um, but he seemed to be given the right message, but he was lost. Um, well, he's but not a Christian was killed. Right. Why are you using Revelation 8 verses 2 through 6 as part of the seventh seal when the, when the passage seems to indicate that the seven trumpets are being discussed starting in Revelation 8 2? Is it labeled our way in the King James? Alan Wright said about it was a label in the word of four ways. I'm not sure, two ways? No, in the E.G. In the White uh, study Bible, it, at, at chapter 8, verse 2, it's labeled the seven, the seven trumpets, as if that's the start of the seven trumpets. And I was wondering why, you, why it sounded like you were including the, the start of the seven trumpets as being part of the seventh seal. No, what I'm saying, and I didn't deal with the seven trumpets, but I do believe that they're part of the seven seal. It, I'm saying that verses 1 through 6 of Revelation 8 is describing the, the intercessory scene that is, rep, that is connected to or represented by him opening the seventh seal. And when he opens the seventh seal, there are seven angels with seven trumpets that are prepared to stand. Okay, now, I didn't deal with that. I like dealing with that. It answers a lot of questions, in, uh, especially about a lot of foolishness in Adventism, okay? because many of the men that have rejected the pioneer understanding of the trumpets, they base part of their argument upon the fact that the seven trumpets parallel the seven last plagues. If you line up the first trumpet with the first plague down the line, probably you know, in the parallel, you'll see they're dealing with the same, same symbols, okay? So it's because of that that some people will say, you know, the seven trumpets are just, are the seven last plagues, and the seven last plagues is just repeating the large and the bottom, and they do a lot of foolish things with them, and in so doing, they destroy the pioneer understanding of the trumpets. So what, I, what I'm saying, and I did not go there, and I said I wasn't going to go there, is that in verses 1 through 6 of Revelation 8, when the seventh seal is being opened, what is being identified is the sealing of God's people. And 
you can, by, by doing these lines that we had up here, that ancient Israel is governed by the seven churches, just as the Christian church is governed by the seven churches, then you can demonstrate that the seventh seal was opened for ancient Israel at Pentecost when there was a sealing. You can demonstrate that the seventh seal was opened in the Millerite history, and therefore at a sealing, and therefore the sealing of 144,000 Christ is doing that same intercessory work, which is, which is symbolically represented as him opening the seventh seal. It's just another line that parallels the increase of knowledge or the advancing glory. It's a, the opening of the seals is, is teaching about how the Lord brings this truth that creates two classes of worship, worshipers together. But I include the seven angels in there because of each of these histories. I said seven angels. But those seven angels in there had seven trumpets. But I include those seven angels that are standing in there because in his intercessory works, in these histories, the fire that he's casting down, that is sealing God's people, is also accomplishing a judgment upon a counterfeit, counterfeit priesthood. All right. It's if you remember, there's in the pattern of of Christ. I, I suggested that there's three dispensations in in sacred history, and there's three counterfeits. The, the counterfeit of the Father is paganism. The counterfeit of Christ is the beast, the Antichrist. Uh, the counterfeit of the Holy Spirit is the false prophet. And as you watch these sacred histories develop, they are there in the prophetic scenario. And in these, in response to the counterfeit priesthood, in his intercessory work, he pronounces punishment, he delivers punishment on these counterfeit priesthood. In, in the sealing of Pentecost for ancient Israel, in Matthew 23, which is right before Matthew 24, the Sermon of the End of the World, which is right before Matthew 25, which is the parable of the Ten Virgins. In Matthew 23, you will find Christ pronouncing seven woes on the counterfeit priesthood of his time period. There's, he actually says eight woes, but verse 16 of Matthew 23, it's not a woe against the Pharisees and the scribes. There's seven times that he says woe against the Pharisees and scribes. And I'm saying that that is in this intercessory period where he's sealing his people in Pentecost. We see in that history that at the same time period, he's dealing with the counterfeit priesthood that is there. And then the seven trumpets, that as we understand them with the pioneers, one of the things they represent is the punishments that are brought against paganism and papalism. And therefore, those seven angels there, when they had the trumpets, they're representing his judgments against paganism and papalism, but they're the same the same angels that pour out the vials of wrath against modern Rome. Now that counterfeit priesthood that's in existence during the sealing of the hundred and forty four thousand. Um, and they're there in the intercessory scene to let us know that when Christ is accomplishing these works, that he has more balls up in the air than we typically think about. And all these balls up in the air are what Ezekiel saw yes. when he seen will within will when he was in that most holy place. And Sister yes. White says when John saw Christ in the most holy place, it's the same vision as Ezekiel, the same vision as Isaiah. And just to add some to what you were saying, it's the same as when Daniel went into the most holy place in Daniel 10, it, and Zechariah went into the most holy place in chapter 3, Sister Wright plainly says so, and Moses went into the holy place when he saw the glory of the Lord, most holy place. So when you go into this intercessory scene, one of the things that's in there is thunderings, lightnings, voices, and an earthquake. I don't know all those, but I believe that when we enter into the most holy place, and we're told to do so, that we enter into the most holy place with Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah. That's where they were. They were all in there at the end of the world and were to hear their voices. It was in there to hear voices. Revelation 4 5 says that there were lightning, thunder, and voices coming out of the throne. But Revelation 4 is clearly in the holy place, not the end of But the throne is represented in the yeah, that, well, that, that's where the throne is, not the throne. No, but, but I've been careful. You may, I'm not going to argue that point, but what I'm saying, I've been careful to say intercessory work. Because when you see the triple unsealing, uh, or the, of the seventh seal, 
This is about Christ's intercessory work, and most certainly when he is opening the seventh seal for ancient Israel, he's in the holy place. So I haven't been locking this in to the most holy place. He accomplishes even there in the holy place. I don't know if I want to put it. Look at 11, 19 of Revelation. It goes, same terms. You'll see earthquake and lightning. I don't see voices. Voice. Lightnings, voices, lightnings, voices, thunderings, and earthquake. And very similar to the one in chapter 8. Is that not correct? Yeah. 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 The phrase appears four times in Revelation. Also, I thought that the standard Adventist understanding was that the period of silence in heaven is at the time after Jesus leaves the temple and is on his way to the earth for the second coming, which would explain the, pit, the picture beside chapter 8-1. If so, doesn't this give this seal a time context that ties it to the seventh plague time after probation closes and to the seventh trumpet due to Revelation 19? I don't have a problem... <clears throat> and I said this up here afterwards to some brothers that were up here asking questions. I don't have a problem with the standard Adventist understanding. I'm not opposing that. <clears throat> but as I've been looking at it, I think I've just come to, although I don't know what it is fully yet, I've come to the conviction that it's more than simply the old Adventist understanding. But, but, what I pointed out here, I didn't really address it specifically, but you'll see the notes. There was silence in heaven at the cross. There's silence in heaven at the day of atonement. And you're, you're suggesting the old Adventist understanding that there's silence in heaven when the angels leave heaven for when Christ comes at the end. I don't have a problem with that. But I'm seeing these silences in heaven representing more than one event. They're representing the, the movements of, the important movements of salvation history when Christ is doing this intercessory work. So I'm not trying to deny that. I'm just not willing to say that because now that I see that re now that I believe that Revelation 8 verses 1 through 6 is identifying at least three times when Christ seals his people, Pentecost, uh, Millerites, 144,000, I'm not willing to limit that to one point in history. That, that was why I put some of, some of the statements that I said earlier, and I had some discussion with a brother here in the evening on the same subject, that the fifth, sixth, and seventh seal are truths. They're not. They're not progressive history. They're truths. And uh, so that's what I was wondering about because, and I'm not saying it's one or the other either way. But if if the seventh seal is tied in time with the seventh trumpet, um, wouldn't that suggest that perhaps there is at least an application where the fifth, sixth, and seventh seal is progressive sequential history because of the seventh and the seventh being tied together in time. The seventh trumpet being the time of. Well, when you say the seventh seal is tied to the seventh trumpet, what do you mean? I mean, in, well, here, I, and I, I could be wrong, but this is just what occurs to me. The silence in heaven, if it is true that at least one application of that is the time when Jesus is on his way to get us, the seventh trumpet, it, it seems to me, when the 24 elders say the time of thy wrath was come, or the time the nations were angered, the time of thy wrath is come, the time of, the, of his wrath is the seventh plague. So it seems to me that's premise tense for the seventh plague, which would put it the same time period, roughly, as the half hour of silence in heaven. And yeah. I'm wondering if those two are tied together in time, doesn't that give at least some sequential context to the fifth, sixth, and seventh? Perhaps, but he doesn't just see the seventh angel there with the seventh trumpet, he sees all seven. And we know that the verse begins shortly after 3.30. I guess I'm still wondering why, I don't know. It seems, I guess what I'm struggling with a little bit is it seems to me like chapter 8, verse 2 is a marker for the repeat and large pattern. If, if the seals and the, and the trumpets run parallel, you're done with the seals, and then verse 2 says, um, here's the seven angels, and they were given seven trumpets. It seems to me like that's the break, where now we are starting the repeat history that was just described in the seven seals, and it's starting again with the seven trumpets. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm questioning a little bit the, the inclusion of those verses within the seventh seal. Well... 
I'm understanding it as the intercessory scene, the seven angels are in there, and I can see those seven angels in the different intercessory scenes with the seven seals all the song kind of that we're stuck in different areas and another subject. But um, let me go to the next question and we'll we refer. No, that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to well. Also in the in the final three one pattern. Why doesn't the fourth angel's message, the loud cry, line up with the fourth way mark without relabeling the second way mark? As being the fourth. In other words, without changing it to one, four, three. It, it's I, always that way. It's always that way, every pattern. When, when you go to the history of Moses, you have three way marks that brings them to Passover. And then they come to... Um, they come to the reform movement of Sabbath after they cross the Red Sea with the manna. Then he receives the law, that's the number four, then the judgment. And the second part of that pattern always shows a one, four, three. If you can use a different way of labeling it where it's not so awkward to say one, four, three, fine. But they all have it. The third way mark for Christ, the cross, is followed by Pentecost. The fourth way mark. But before Pentecost, you have the reform, the number one of the disciples putting away their sins, followed by this, and then Pentecost followed by the stoning of Stephen and three. So there's always a one. Okay, I guess, and I'll just, I'll go, as you talk, one thing jumps out at me. In the period of Christ, you're saying the third way mark is the cross, and the fourth is Pentecost. Pentecost is our greatest type in the latter reign. So why is the latter reign and the latter prime message the fourth way mark also in the final three plus one pattern? And and in, in, in Christ's pattern, it doesn't... No, 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 just, just ask your question and leave it there. What, what, you said the question, why isn't the loud cry and Pentecost? The it is. So why are they both the fourth in the one in the one three pattern? So the they're both the fourth. The first is one of the number one. What else would they be? Uh, well, it seems to me that when I saw the pattern go up on the board, you had the the ladder rain loud cry between the second and third lane marks. And unless you be labeled as increasing the knowledge, the maybe you were misunderstanding for increasing. <laughs> I mean, I'm in the middle right here. You've got the one, two, three way marks lining up with the first, second, and third angels' messages. Okay. I don't know how much time we have left, but I'll tell you how I understand it, and then you tell me what it is for, for, for some reason I'm not understanding how you're seeing it, and I don't mind us disagreeing, but I would like to understand what you're saying, okay? I can see it too, but this is First Angel's Message, 1840. Second Angel's Message, 1842. Third Angel's Message, 1844, right? Fourth Angel's Message is down here. We're saying in 2001. We're leaving out a lot of the, the characteristics just to make the point. We're saying that all the the fourth wave marks are a type of the second wave mark. Right? That they're similar, but, but they are different, aren't they? I mean. How? Oh. Yeah, well, there's, the there's second, differences. The message came in 1842. The fourth angel's message, like you were saying, proper doesn't come until the latter reign. I mean, so in history, they've got to be. So they're, they come in history different. I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that yeah. one. But they're both, messages both are bad and it's fallen. And when Sister White, so Sister White says there's, there's, no, no there's yeah. Sister White says there's two times that Christ cleansed the temple. The beginning and ending of his ministry, and then she compares the first time he cleanses his temple with the second angel's message, and the second time he cleanses his temple with the fourth angel's message. So I suppose we could say that the two times Christ cleansed the temple were different, but as a symbol, they're the same. 
I mean, there's, there's no doubt there's different that's, people that's in the temple all the time. Why is it different? I mean, they're two different events, but a similar message, a similar function. They're, they're symbols. They're, they're symbols of the cleansing of the temple. Okay, so she's saying, this is the cleansing of the temple. This is the cleansing of the temple. The second angels and fourth angels message are the same message. In that sense. Even if they come in history at different times, same message. Okay. If, but if, if this is the same message as this message, this message was preceded by this message. And it was followed by this message. Now, what this message is, it, it's, it's different. Every, every time it's different, but it always possesses the same characteristic at several levels. But the primary level is, is the first message convicts of sin. The second, righteousness is manifested. And judgment. Those are the characteristics. So what we're saying is, is that this first message is a message that convicts of sin. And in this one, righteousness will be manifested. And this will have some kind of illustration of judgment. Now the illustration of judgment here is not going to be identical to the illustration of judgment here, but it, they'll both possess the characteristics that allows you to identify judgment. So it, it, you can't get real technical or you can destroy them all easily. One is saying that one is the judgment, and the other one is the close of the executive judgment. Okay. Judgment begins, judgment ends. Right. Okay, so, but Sister White says that these are going to run parallel. Right? right? So we bring this, this whole history, and bring it down here to run it parallel. So where where is it now? Are you okay now? Because this is how I think I've been portraying it. So now I'm going to explain how I apply it. <clears throat> Miller brings a message of sin. There's a, a message to convict of sin. When you see such a white identifying William Miller's message, it's identifying the same type of message as the Laodicean message. They have the same message here that comes to Adventism. It convicts them of sin. And that message is fear God and glory to him, the hour of his judgment is come. The first angel's message. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it just says the first and second angel's message are repeated in the third, and this is the third angel's message. It's a repeat of this first and second angel's message. We read several quotes that say that. Right. And the next one is Paul about Yeah, but in the next one, righteousness is to be manifested. The righteousness that was manifested here in this in this one was the midnight cry. The righteousness that's manifested in this message is the loud cry. This message begins when the Protestants of the United States close their doors. And this message begins when the Protestants of the United States close their doors. This judgment this is the beginning of judgment. This is the end of judgment. In, in 1844, Christ came in the clouds. At, at this point, Christ comes in the clouds. When this message was in power, the angel of Revelation 10 came down. When this message is in power, the angel of Revelation 18 came down. The time of the end is then for, for this message is Daniel 11 verse 40. The time of the end for this message is Daniel 11 verse 40. Okay, and I, you just, cool. yeah. when we get time, <coughs> just space and I'll stop. What I'm seeing is there's a time of the end and a time of the end. They seem to line up perfectly. There's an increase of knowledge after each. That seems like a perfect parallel. But in, in the in the, the drop down that the end time that one that one what happened to the one two three in between it's on the top line and then you have the one four three that's that got dropped when you, that uh, is that is the one four three but in the first pattern that's all the Millerite history in that first pattern it had both shouldn't the end time have where did both? where did it have both the mill that's why you wrote the one two three and then the one four three that was the Millerite. The, 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 this may help. This may help. 
This is the Millerite history, but this is the history of Adventism. Mm -hmm. And the history of Adventism has a beginning and an end. This is the beginning, this is the end. This is the beginning of Adventism, this is the end of Adventism. This is the history of Adventism. This is the Millerite history. This is the history of the 144,000. Right. And they're illustrated upon, they're, they're treated as one great reform movement. And they have to be treated that way. They have to be treated that way. Because I'm sure you probably know, Sister White gives evidence that had they all been wise virgins, the Lord would have come ere this. Okay, there was, he, he left the potential that the millwrights could have actually finished the work. Now, I don't know how. I don't know how it, the papacy could rise to power and, and Islam come into history. That's a big can of worms in terms of, you know, conditional prophecy. But nevertheless, <coughs> the potential was there. This is the beginning of Adam, and this is the end of Adam. So, you know, I think what she, please correct me if I'm wrong. Could I go up there? Is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> This is one progressive line from, right, I understand that. from 1798 mm -hmm. until Michael stands up and every case decided. This is one progressive line. This, and I'll do this for you because it helps me understand. We'll cross section this final portion. This is one progressive timeline from 1798 until the time that Michael stands up. And every case is decided, human probation is closed. But the quote says, that which follows the first and second has to run parallel to what Brother Jeff is doing. He's taking this cross-section portion and he's dropping it down here so that it can run parallel with it. This is not part of the Millerite history. Right. This is just what transpires after the Millerite history it's the that you continue on yeah. until the end of time. Right. I, I guess what, what I'm saying is, if, if, if every revival is a three plus one pattern, which is what I've been hearing, there should be a three plus one for the Millerite history. I thought Jamal put it on the board this morning when he used that one, two, three, and then he put the four as 1888. <coughs> and so that gives the Millerite history a three plus one pattern, excluding the end time marker of 1798. So if you drop it down, where's the three plus one pattern? Four markers at the end time pattern, excluding the 1989 date. And you said it was the second coming of Christ at one point. I'm not sure if that's where... No, I'm saying you, know. you can see this pattern in different places, but I didn't know Jamal had said that. that in that case, Jamal should be the one to explain <laughs> this. Uh, how is it the fourth way of our case? I think we should play the tape, because I never said that. No, so when, you, when she was talking to you up here privately, you haven't got a tape to, to back no, up. Well, well, the the angels back she back said back. I put that on the board when I was preaching. I said I never said that. I, I tried to clear that up up there. Okay. But in any case, 1888 is definitely an illustration of this. The Lord was willing to finish this in 1888. He began to do this work in 1888, so it is a time. But, but that hiccup in the process is, is nailed down in the history of Moses, because Joshua and Caleb are Jones and Wagner. It's, a, it's the same history. It's a, it's a, the Lord wanted to take them right into the Promised Land. He wanted to take Adventism into the Promised Land, but we rejected the Lord. Well, she compared it. How about if we, if we don't even go with the Millerite experience? Any old revival in history, three plus one pattern is what I've heard. If you look at that line here, you've got for the end time, you've got, a, you've got three way marks. The only place that one could go is the second coming, which would be the fourth way mark in that pattern. 1888. No, 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 no. It doesn't matter. But the bottom line. Okay, okay. 1888. Pentecost. 1888 is the coming of the Lord. All right. The Lord came down on Sinai on Pentecost to give the Ten Commandments. Sister White compares the Lord coming down on Sinai with the second coming of Christ. So you can put down here the second coming of Christ and, and see that pattern if you need to do it. It is not germane to what we're teaching, and it isn't the direction of the prophet. The prophet says that what follows the third angel's message is to run parallel with it. And the reason the prophet tells us that is she, she knows that we're required to understand when the latter rain begins to fall. 
and that this history here is an illustration of the latter rain, and this is what we're supposed to see here, is when it starts, when it gets underway. I'm not threatened. I, I don't remember it. I'm not prepared to to spit it out, but I've had friends come and tell, show me that this 3-1 pattern goes all the way to the destruction of the wicked at the end of the millennium, okay? And that's what I was telling you earlier, I didn't explain myself. It's a work of the Holy Spirit is always going to possess these characteristics. But you, it seems like maybe you're... Um, I don't, it's just that the fourth way mark in that in that final line seems like it, to me it should line up with the fourth angel's message, and if the only place for it is the second coming, that's not the time of the fourth angel's message. I know this is the fourth angel's message. I'm not. I won't. I, I can't go there. This is the fourth angel's message. And it seems to me at one time those first three were lined up with the first, second, and third angel's message. The third angel's message being the the biggest one that deals with the Sunday law crisis. You should have asked the question when you saw the difference. I did. I don't know if the just got cut off. Well, I meant, you know, so the rest of us can see where you're at because I don't remember any of that. But, but it just seems the basic problem is the trying to see the fourth way mark in the history of Advent. Well, okay. But so let, me talk, let me let me respond something to you. Let, let me say something. You're one of the one of the things that you're saying is that early on, before this meeting, you thought that I was teaching the structure of this differently than I'm now teaching. Yeah, I thought you had the third part right. of the There, I, I was, I understood this study probably 25 years ago. This is the first thing that I thought was interesting in prophecy. We started studying it with our friends in our home at least 20 years ago. Uh, way before I'd ever seen anything on the King of the North. The first thing I ever had opportunity to preach publicly at Hope International was this study. And we printed a book. It wasn't as complete as this, but we printed a book. It's called Prophetic Timelines. And you can get the prophetic timelines, and it's graphically illustrated that at that time, I was teaching the three, four, and a one, four, three down here. It's in print. I've been I've been publicly on record from the very beginning as teaching it just this way. So I I make a lot of mistakes, you know, even just mistakes and saying things differently than I want to say and not catching them. So you may have heard me when I was saying something incorrectly. I do that, but the public record of how I've taught this, I've always taught it this way. I can show you that one of those. Prophetic Timelines magazines and show you it's right there and that's the very first time we ever talk about it. Shall we pray? <laughs> Heavenly Father, we, we know that um, as we cross swords in a loving fashion that there are there are areas that you take us to that allow us to see things more clearly, that uh, stretch our minds out to where you want, want them to be so we can approach things from a different way. And we, we ask that this is how we relate to our conversation here, that you're trying to instruct us, teach us all, help us uh, grow up into this message, and we thank you for this um, this question and answer period. And so we thank you for all of them that we've had during this school here. As we part ways, we ask that you would bless this time that we've spent upon this mountain. And we know that when we leave encampments like this, that Satan is ready and prepared to try to take us down into the valleys, into the, the discouragements and traps that he's setting for us as we leave. And we ask that you give us discernment to um, watch for these things, keep our hearts and minds lifted up to you, and then fulfill the responsibility we have to test these things. We've been hearing here during this time period. It's obvious, Lord, that you're finishing this work on earth, and we once again ask to be allowed to be part of that, that final movement. We thank you for the opportunity for this in Jesus' name. Yeah.